actually like to begin with a song. And it doesn't say that I'm a singer. And only recently I started putting there that I'm a writer. I mean, if you sing, you're a singer. I'm not like a professional singer. And the book that made me turn to song and poetry again is this thing which I've been working on for three years. As you can see, it's a book that says, do you really want to read me? Uh, or do you really want to be published? Because it's taken a lot of effort and work over three years. And it involved some singing, which with, I'll begin. And then I'll explain a bit about the song. Uh, <clears throat> since we are in the business of truth, uh, it's a 15th century poet, writer, self-taught person called Kabir. How many of you have heard of the word Kabir, the name Kabir? Uh, he's probably one of the most translated poets from India. Tagore gave it a shot in the yeah. 1920s. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, bad translations, yeah. but uh, he mm -hmm. got the lyrical spirit of Kabir. Robert Bly from the US is very famous for having uh, performed, he performs it with uh, music. The, uh, okay. Often you can catch it on Robert Bly. He's a poet himself and he translated Kabir. And there have been lots of people, Arvind Krishna Mahirotra from India, A.K. Mahirotra, uh, who's also a much published poet and translator. But, and there's also the fact that Kabir never wrote a book. So he sang it to people, he's from Banaras, and he, the legend is that, and a lot of myth and fable goes around how he really is a coeval of contemporary, uh, contemporaneous with Shakespeare. But he sat by the ghats of Banaras, the bank, banks of the river Ganga there, and he sang these songs, which he said were the truth. And there were followers who picked it up, and even today his songs are sung necessarily, and they're not necessarily read in books by a lot of people. And the songs that are picked up are from people who sing, uh, not from books. And they keep changing it. Every time they add a bit of themselves into the song. So it's a very, and, and they sing it in different ways, classical, what's called folk, what's called popular, and what's called bhakti music, devotion music. Uh, I'll turn on a contraption if you don't mind. It's an app. To download that one as well. Oh, it's just an app which is uh, called iTanpura because it's an iPhone. <laughs> mm. such signs, I cannot utter, utter them with the stung of mine. They cannot be captured in these vain lines. So he establishes the fact that it cannot be described, what he has experienced. And then he goes on to give you five beautiful similes of what truth is like. So first, there's a negation, and then the affirmation of the truth. So 
And the second line, which I, I mean, the second stanza which I sang says, In this world of mine, neither the bounteous earth nor the splendorous sky, no breeze to caress my face, no water to kiss my lips. And in this book, only one stanza is used, which is this one. In this world of mine, no one dies, no one is born. There is no dusk, there is no dawn. There is no reason, no rhyme. There is no space, no time. Step by single step, I reach this kingdom. My soul has climbed to its final freedom. So, when I met Venkat Raman Singh Sham, his name is a mouthful, I call him Venkat, uh, Venkat Sham. He's an Adivasi artist. Adivasi in India would translate here as tribal or indigenous person or aboriginal. And he walked into my office having seen an earlier graphic novel I published using art from that region, which is central India, near Bhopal, about eight hours from there actually. So he lives in Bhopal now. Walks into my office and says, let's make a book about my life. And he has been many things including uh, a rickshaw puller, which is uh, at the back of the book. And there was an earlier version I did in November where we put it uh, on the front of the cover, but later we decided to go, go for a more abstract cover and still, this is not the final, this is a dummy. So when he walked in and said, uh, we have to write the story, I said, you tell me whatever and then I'll write you for the pictures. But it wasn't working. And then I decided uh, to travel with him to his village, etc. And once I asked him, why do you, he has an SUV, he's got iPhone latest, he's got all kinds of more apps than I do on my phone. He taught me how to use my iPhone better than I do. Uh, and he's a school dropout. So once you asked him, once I asked him, why do you live in this, along this uh, gutter and in this slum? And he gave me an answer which is in, again, a Kabir poem. He used to keep quoting this Kabir poet who was probably a thousand miles away from where he lived and it's an older tradition which, is, uh, which he has inherited. He says, Kaudi, Kaudi, Maya, Jodi, Log Kahe Ghar Mera, Nagar Tera, Nagar Mera, Chidiya, Rayna Basera. So I'm just re reciting the Hindi to you to get the sense of the alliteration and the rhythms that are uh, there, which makes it easy to remember, and he didn't read it in a book. So uh, the book actually kind of ends with uh, that translation. Brick by brick you build a house, say it's mine. The moon does not claim the night with its moonshine. So you don't claim this is my house, you want me to say. So I said, how do I work with this guy? He's going to keep giving me these little songs. So I said, okay, uh, I'll make this a part of the book. And he started singing me his creation songs for, of his community, which have been passed on for maybe 2,000 years. So I learned those creation songs, started translating them. And this book made me rethink all these things I've been thinking. I read Catherine Wu earlier. I read nonfiction of various kinds. I was very affected by James Aggie when I read him. I took a lot of time to read this. It takes a lot of time to read a book like Aggie. You never are quite done with it. Uh, and then I started, I had been thinking and I had been anxious about how do you write another person's life and I had seen a lot of writers do it with aplomb and confidence and they land there, there are parachute journalists, there are also immersion journalists. So immersion journalism is a term that's now quite commonly used and Aggie is an example of that. And when I read Catherine Boo and this was the time when I met Martin which is why I'm here and I offered a kind of a impromptu critique of my uh, uh, unease with the kind of book that I read. <coughs> I just read a little uh, blurb from Ramachandra Guha, one of India's foremost historians, author of India After Gandhi, which has also been published here. Uh, more evocative than the finest novel, more insightful than the finest works of sociology. So these are like blurb comments, you know, so they're done, packaged for this kind of a packaging of the book. And Ram Guha, I must tell you, uh, from an interview he did 10 years ago, uh, or 12 years ago about uh, Arundhati Roy, he said, she must stick to writing fiction. I don't read fiction, but she must stick to writing fiction. So this is a guy who doesn't read fiction, saying that this is <laughs> <he doesn't laughs> stick to fiction. So it's like also, and I've also met a lot of academics who don't read fiction, who really love Amitabh Ghosh. I'm sure he's translated and you, you must have heard of Amitabh mm -hmm. Ghosh. He's always not getting the book up, so it's like, uh, <laughs> he's just going there to the shortlist and then he's coming back and having given it to another fellow Indian called Arvind Dadika. Another example of uh, fiction writing which uh, almost borrows, borrows, becomes non-fiction. You know, you never charge fiction with this 
thing of being. And with Amitabh Ghosh, I've always felt that he's actually a non-fiction writer masquerading as a fiction writer. Mm -hmm. Because there's so much research that goes in and he wants to put all of it there. And uh, <coughs> I would boldly accuse him of a lack of imagination. Uh, because this, this, just because you went to a gym and got a tricep, if you wear a very tight t-shirt and say, can you see my tricep? Uh, you know, so it's that kind of uh, fiction writing. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I promised myself after working with Brinkert that I would be very nice to everybody, but uh, that's not me. Uh, then it came to the question of how I engage with, what is my critique of this? And this came at around the same time as another uh, work of non-fiction called A Free Man. It was published by Norton in the U.S. and it was uh, mutually admired by, you know, uh, 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 Catherine Boo, who did the Behind the Beautiful Forevers, which has now become a, a national theatre play in London uh, at the South Bank. Uh, they've adapted it. David Hare has adapted it into a, a stage, uh, into the stage production. She blurbed Aman Sethi's book, which is about a daily, daily wage labourer who goes around doing many jobs, and the protagonist is Muhammad Ashraf. So as a reporter for a national magazine called Frontline, working on labor issues, he meets this character called Muhammad Ashraf, with whom he spend, begins to spend a lot of time, Aman Sethi. And then he uh, really starts taking a lot of notes, and then he goes to New York and to Columbia School of Journalism, and then there is this template which is there, which is the way you have to write a non-fiction life, and he tries to do that. He was he very gratefully acknowledges the help of various people, including his editor Chiki Sarkar, about how she taught him how to shape the book. And it's a kind of a hit book, successful. And again, I was very very anxious about it, and I said, okay, have you read Aggie? And you, you do see that Aman Sethi has put himself into the book, and yet, what is what is it that Muhammad Ashraf, the protagonist? who uh, eventually, uh, in the book, he doesn't die, but you know he's going to die. And he's a footloose laborer, as he's called. When I was working with Venkat, Venkat has done all these things. He's been a rickshaw puller, a house painter. He has starved for six days in Delhi. He knows what is hunger in a real sense, palpable sense. Uh, he has survived on chai for six days in Delhi, he told me. So I found myself in a big dilemma as to, now how am I going to pull this off without really uh, finding myself compromised? and feeling gutted, like sometimes you feel like going and throwing out whatever you have written. But here I had the responsibility of collaborating with this guy. Initially I said, you tell, I'll write and your name will be there and I'll just be there inside as as told to or something, but it didn't work. At one point Venkat turned to me and said, you've got to be in on this 50-50. It's as much of, in terms of how a book works, what is storyboarding, how do you do sequential things and how do you play with the art and text and how do you make text a part of art. So this was, this was not just text, it was just not about telling a life, it was also about telling an artist's life and about how words can have mean more than what they literally come to do and how, how, do, how, how did I arrive at that? So there's a form in which he tells me stories which is laden with myth and fable. So he always takes recourse about his own life, he's mythifying all the time and uh, making it a fable. So how do you capture that? And then using songs all the time. Kabir, his own creation songs, other kinds of songs, sometimes fragments of songs. How do you do that? So that is when I realized that it's, I was reading Pessoa at that time, and then <coughs> this quiet. And here was an autobiography told through fragments. You could open it anywhere, and you would not get the truth about Pessoa's life. And this Kabir, song which I sang and uh, translated for you now, it has a similar perception of truth that Pessoa seems to have. Pessoa believes that writing is an act of failure. He says, when I get up from my chair, enjoying the sunshine and want to go write about it, it's gone. The thought which I had is never going to be translated. You know, writing is an act of translation and for him, what comes out in, uh, in, 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 on the paper is uh, that's why he wrote under so many heteronyms. He was initially not sure of what he was, what he, whether he wanted to present himself. And when he writes an autobiography, again, it's a kind of illusion. Where is Pessoa? You really, he's not going to tell you, I was born here, I did this, I did that. He's just sitting and sometimes describing the jacket somebody is wearing ahead of him, and then he makes a big entry. And then you move to another entry, you move to another entry. So 
somewhere down the line I was mixing a lot of things that I was reading and influenced by and through Venkat and his perception of what a book uh, like this could be and which is where I started looking back at something like Catherine Wu. I'm going to read a short passage from this uh, and I have no sense of time, you have to stop me somewhere. <laughs> I mean the organizers did write to me and said 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, so. There's an author's note at the end of Kathleen Wu's book. I mean, when I read it, I found it quite unputdownable. I just had to read it. And uh, that is what a lot of people say of the book. Whereas with Aggie, it's the opposite. You never can read him at a stretch because he's putting himself in. He's asking you, what is it I'm doing? Uh, why am I here? And these kind of moral anxieties, do you really need to, need to make a part of the book? You, you were also talking about it. Do you want to put yourself in the book? Or how much of it do you want to do? The events recounted in the preceding pages are real, as are all the names. From the day in November 2007 that I walked into Annawadi and met Asha and Manju until March 2011 when I completed my reporting, I documented the experience of residents with written notes, video recordings, audio tapes and photographs. This is a book about a slum which is very close to the Bombay airport and this is the glitzy Bombay airport which is being redone by one GDK consortium is being privatized and they wanted it to look slick so that when foreigners come they feel like they are in the first world but once you step, even as you land you will see the slums which are being described in the book so the title is from uh, Holding which she saw as uh, advertising Holding which said Behind the Beautiful Forever so that became the title of the book and at one point when she describes somewhere a late night fight in a house between a family I was thinking, how the hell did she know? And she writes it like fiction, like, you know, uh, the device of fiction is constantly used. And that's when I realized, you know, it's like literally putting camera up people's arses. Uh, <laughs> because you've got a camera fixed there, when you're not there, you want to see what's happening in that house. Yeah. I found it quite distasteful, to be very frank. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you a scene from this where you have that kind of description, page 170. I'm going to read a passage. Uh, when Sanjay reached Dharavi, his 14-year-old sister, Anandi, was making tomato chutney for dinner. She nearly dropped the bowl when she saw the fear in his face. The two were close and recently in rare position of disposable income. He had had a first initial tattoo next to his own on his forearm. So this is the brother tattooing the name of the sister on his forearm as a gesture of love. Anandi often chided him that any brother who loved his sister as much as he professed to would come home more often. But as much as he professed to come home more often, I'm sorry, but uh, their 60 square foot hut was too small for three people and Sanjay liked to be near the airport, said it, he said it made him feel he had a chance to get away. Sanjay took his sister's hand and as they sat knee to knee on the floor, told her of seeing men swarm Kalu all at once. Kalu is a character who dies in the previous pages. They killed my friend, he kept repeating, just threw him off like he was garbage. So now you have this vivid description of this scene where the, husband, the sister and brother are together and meet to me. Uh, and then the conversations are reproduced. So it's an as told too. Clearly she did a lot of research. And I want to go back to her author's note and explain to you why it is so problematic for me to be able to read this without really saying no. The gifted and their th she uses a lot of research assistance, she doesn't know the language she says and one of the reasons why she says she decided she could do this book was she ends up tripping over an average dictionary in a Washington DC home. I found myself on the floor with a punctured lung and three broken ribs in a spreading pool of Diet Dr. Pepper. I don't know what that is, maybe it's some kind of a coke. Uh, unable, to slither, <laughs> unable to slither to a phone. In the hours that passed I arrived at a certain clarity. Having proved myself ill-suited to a safe cohabitation with an unabridged dictionary, I had little to lose by pursuing my interest in another quarter, a place beyond my so-called expertise where the risk of failure would be great, but the interactions somewhat more meaningful. So, a little accident in our house makes her feel, I might as well go live in Islam. And she does, for three years. And in this she is aided and abetted by a lot of uh, research assistants, and she names them, and I would unpack the uh, surnames, the question of what S stands for will become more clear then. The gifted and generous Mrinmayi Ranade made this transition possible. 
She was my translator in the first six months of this project and her deep intelligence, scrupulous ear and warm presence allowed me to come to know the people of Annawadi and for them to know me. Second help is Kavita Mishra, a college student, also translated ably in 2008. And beginning in April of that year, so which means she had a research assistant for four months and that other research assistant left, the first one left, there's a third one. I want to know why they all left. I don't know. <laughs> That's another book. <laughs> the third one is Unnati Tripathi. The second one was Kavita Mishra. The first one was Mrinayini, Mrinmayini Ranade. The third one was a brilliant young woman who had studied sociology at Mumbai University, joined the project as a translator. She was skeptical of a Westerner writing about slum dwellers, but her attachments to Anavardians proved greater than her reservations. So she's giving away something about how people who worked with her had some reservations. And she quickly became a fierce co-investigator and critical inter interlocutor. Her insights littered the book. So it describes in about eight pages the process of making the book. So why I'm emphasizing the surnames is all these three are what you would call high caste Brahmins who would otherwise have little to do with that, that slum. So the slum dweller is going to be equally skeptical of a Ranade, uh, which is top class Brahmin, Mishra, another Brahmin, and Tripathi, which literally means somebody whose ancestor read three Vedas. So, uh, so these, all these names are going to be equally uh, challenging to the Anavadi slum dwellers. And there are times when, in the note, she also says, they opened up to me in a way in which they won't even open up to their families. Of course, I won't tell uh, certain secrets to my mother, which I can tell a stranger absolutely over a drink. Uh, but that, that doesn't mean much as to why they confided in me. Yeah. And they confided in Kathleen Wu through all these other named and unnamed researchers. And that is all, author's note. And I'll quickly read to you from Aggie and his whole problem. And uh, most of you here would have read Aggie, but. Uh, and then he talks about how. He's, he's actually terrified about writing this book and it was rejected and it, people said turn this around, you can't write like this and you guys should know this book. It seems to me curious not to say obscene and thoroughly terrifying that it would occur to an association of human beings drawn together through need and chance and for profit into a company, an organ of journalism, to pry intimately into the lives of an undefended and appallingly damaged group of human beings an ignorant and helpless rural family for the purpose of parading the nakedness, disadvantage and humiliation of these lives before another group of human beings, that is us, in the name of science, quote unquote, honest journalism, whatever that paradox may mean, of humanity, of social fearlessness, for money and for a reputation for crusading and for unbiased, which when skillfully qualified as skillfully enough qualified is exchangeable at any bank for money. And it's one long, unending sentence. I won't uh, read the whole thing. So here is this anxiety. And whereas quickly in this book, you will say Amartya Sen, the Nobel winning economist, uh, Indian uh, writer, a beautiful account told through real life stories of the sorrows and joys, anxieties and stamina, in the lives of the precarious and powerless. Same words which bother Aggie a lot. But here, there's a certain surety. 2011, you finish your research. 2012, your book is out. You've got the American Non-Fiction non Book of the Year Award, 2012. And chapter closed. And it can become a play, it can become a movie, it can uh, be many things. And that is the urban world's perception of slum dweller reality in Bombay. And there was a critique of this book daily and a couple of critiques which really ripped the book to shreds and said this is part of a liberalization agenda, they, all they want is these slums to be cleaned up in a different way. It wasn't that bad. For me the other compromises here, other anxieties here are of more a moral political nature. Of what do you do with these kind of subjectivities which are involved, how, how much, it's not as if everybody needs to put themselves in the book like Ivy does. Uh, but, they, or like Aman Sethi does. He's, a character in the book himself. It's, he, it's, it's about male bonding, that entire book. They smoke joints, they spend time together, they talk about women, they talk about life. And uh, so, and a similar, and then this is this is the literary non-fiction thing, and I'll just give you one more example of the kind of books that are being written about India. This is about the 2611 Bombay, uh, uh, I'll, I'll stop after this, and uh, the Taj Hotel uh, attack, the siege it is called. 
and this minute by minute account comes at you like a battering ram and takes your breath away. With a masterly control of its white canvas, it marshals a cross section of guest security services and heroic uh, Taj staff. Another blurb says, I read, I read it in what felt like three blinks. So you need this racy thriller account of a real event and real uh, deaths. Uh, and this is done very well. This is the second successful book based on India. The first one was about the kidnapping of five Western tourists in Kashmir in 1997. By, sorry, by who is this? This one is by Kathy uh, Scott Clark and Adrian Levy. Uh, it's called The Siege, Trapped Inside the Taj Hotel. Run or hide. It's almost like a, a Hollywood <laughs> film yeah. poster, yeah. you know, the way things are done. And it's packaged like this is the paperback, train paperback. Then there's the first one, and they plan everything out as to what to market it, how to sell it. And it's going to be made into a film, and they're, they're, it's got dramatis personae. And uh, faces, photographs, and what they do, short synopsis of their lives. And, right, I could read it in a day. Uh, so, I mean, that's a bad thing for me. Uh, thank you.